Okay, welcome back. This is lesson number two. And at this point, it's worth us just recapping what we did last time. So we're going to start off all of our subsequent lessons with this activity. Jog your memory. How much can you remember from last time? So you don't have to write this down. Uh, you can if you want. You can use a, a piece of scrap paper again or the backs of your books. But I'm just going to pose those three questions. Where are the broads? What are the broads and why are they popular? OK, so if you want to pause the screen for a second, try to answer those. Good luck. All right, so hopefully you've remembered a little bit about what we did last lesson. If you haven't, then go back through your work and just have a quick read and uh, jog your memory. So today's lesson is called the landscape of the broads or the landscapes of the broads. So if you can add that as a title into your book and underline it, please. Same again, um, we have three lesson objectives. They are also there on the screen. Again, don't worry about writing these into your books, but they're there for us to refer to at the end of the lesson just to make sure that we've covered what we want to. So the first thing that we're going to be looking at is learning about the different land uses in the broads. So that essentially just means how are the broads areas or the, the areas within the broads used, what are the different land uses of the land within the broads. Uh, we're going to improve our skills of condensing key information. So this is one of the things that you will do throughout your um, years studying geography is you'll be given um, large amounts of information. And one of the skills that you need to develop is being able to turn that into more manageable, smaller chunks. So we'll be doing that today. And then we're also going to be doing a classic traditional form of geography data presentation, I think, called an annotated field sketch. We're going to apply the understanding that we've learned today and the information that we've gathered to an annotated field sketch. So to start off with, I'm going to get you to think about the types of landscape that you might expect to see within the broads. So here in the uh, middle of the screen, we have a view of some people standing on top of a church tower. And what I would like you to do is to imagine that you are those people stood on top of that church tower. And I'd like you, if you can, to try and make a list of as many different land uses that you can see from the vantage point that you have got there. So, for instance, one of those land uses is residential or just housing. You can see just to the right of the church tower there is some housing. So housing is a form of land use. You can see some water. So waterways or lakes or rivers, that is a type of land use. You can see some trees. But what else? What might be beneath those trees? What other kind of things could the land in this landscape be used for? So there's your first challenge to write down as many ideas as you can to think about the different types of land use which are in the broads. Can you do this now, please? Can you please find the accompanying worksheet for today's lesson? This is lesson number two, and you should have a set of resources which are called the landscapes of the broads. Um, print those off, and I'd like you to take this one, uh, the one with the 12 boxes on it, and have that in front of you so you can understand what it is that I'd like you to do for this first activity. We're going to do something called Broads Glow Bingo. Now you can see that text box, although that grid that you have there has got 12 different land uses um, on it. All of those kind of greeny blue text boxes refer to a different land use. The first one says broads and then we've got towns and villages, rivers and wet woodland. So those 12 different land uses are 12 different types of land uses that we have in the broads. So we have coastline, we have these things called drainage dikes, we have drainage marshes, uh, grazing marshes, uh, we have tourist areas, things called fens, and even tourist attractions. So you will see that underneath each of those headings, there is a uh, supporting bit of text, and that tells us a little bit about 
the type of land use that um, the heading is referring to. So the broad is what we would call a mosaic of landscapes. It's a real mixture of different landscapes. We have lakes, rivers, agricultural land, towns, um, you know, tourist areas, a, a real selection. So the information in the grid below, below um, the, uh, the title there, provides an explanation of some of the landscapes and land uses within the broads. Now, underneath those um, text boxes, there are 12 different questions and they are labeled Q1, Q2, etc. Q1 refers to the broads area. Q2 refers to areas to do, including towns and villages. Q3 is a question about rivers. So what I would like you to do is to press pause on the screen now and see how many of those questions you think you can answer. So you might choose to write the answers in there just in pencil, or you might choose to spend a bit longer and actually do some research for this. You might go onto the internet where you might use a few books or different resources that you might have to try and find the answers to as many of those questions as you can. Don't worry if you can't find all of the answers because that's what we're going to do next. We're going to go through those answers so you can have a completed set of um, those answers when we will use them for the next, next activity. OK, so press pause now. OK, so hopefully you had some joy in finding some of the answers to those questions. If you didn't or if you have perhaps got some of those answers not strictly correct, now's the opportunity to rub them out and to write in um, the correct answer. So the first question was referring to the broads and it says, which is the biggest broad? Well, the answer hopefully that you found was this Hickling. Hickling Broad is the biggest lake in the Broads National Park. There are 63 broads within the Broads National Park. They're all shallow, they're all man-made lakes. And as it says there in the information, they began as uh, pits which were dug for peat to provide fuel during medieval times. And they've then filled up with water over the centuries since to become the boating lakes that we now see as a kind of a, a boating playground now. Question number two here is about the towns and villages and the people within the Broads. There's a nice aerial picture there. The question says, how many people live in the Broads National Park? The answer to that question is 6,300 residents within the Broads. OK. Next question was about the rivers. There are seven major rivers in the Broads with over 125 miles of navig navigable waterways. All the rivers are connected and it's possible to travel them all inland and without needing to access the sea. So you can do a huge amount of boating and sailing and paddling and canoeing and kayaking within the broads without actually ever needing to go out into the open sea and open water. The third question here says, which is the longest river in the broads? And the answer to that is the river Bure. River Bure. Four here is referring to wet woodlands. This is a rare form of woodland in the UK, but we have over 3,000 hectares of it within the Broads. This is a strange type of woodland, really, and it's a little bit swampy. Um, often waterlogged soils and trees that are growing out of wet ground um, with shallow roots. And they make fantastic habitats for amphibians and grass snakes, herons in particular, but also things like otters, owls, bats, and all sorts of different insects as well. So what is the common name for wet woodland? Well, in lots of places, you would probably get a way of calling this a swamp. Um, but technically, this area, this type of area is known as older car or car woodland, older car. And actually, you'll see on lots of maps, there are lots of places around the country known as older car and that's because these are areas of wet woodland. The next question is asking us about the mills in the broads. Well this is one of the iconic landscapes of the broads are the mills that we see dotted around the waterways. There are still over 70 of them across the broads landscape. They originally were used to help drain the land, the waterlogged land of water, and to pump it elsewhere. The mills are now where they are still remaining, a large tourist 
attraction and uh, often one of the kind of key things that photographers like to take a photograph of as you can see here is a wonderful reflection of this mill in the uh, in the sunlight or in the probably the sunset I would have thought um, as the uh, the sun goes down over the broads here which is the last full-size working windmill in the broads well hopefully you were able to find the answer to this which is herring fleet windmill a very very nice example of a mill question six this is a very typical view as you drive along or sail along through the broads 40 percent of this area is known as wet grassland and this grassland has been drained and is very very good for growing grass is very kind of fertile soil and very good for cows in particular very flat land and, and cows generally prefer flatter fields rather than hillier um, hillier terrain so where you have lush areas of grassland like this and it's nice and flat absolutely ideal for large herds of cattle the broad authority work with farmers to make sure that these habitats are are ideal for not only livestock but also for breeding waders and waterfowl and all sorts of you know, other bird life too so the question here says what is the most common type of livestock found on the marshes well i've given it away really okay so one of the things that you will see in the broads are not only rivers and lakes but also this network of straight water channels and these are things that we call dikes and dikes are man-made water ways that essentially have been dug to help wet grassland drain and drain the water away from that grassland so the, the land is much more usable so rather than being boggy and uh, difficult to walk across a series of drainage um, dikes have been installed over many many years and um, they work to move the water away from these marshy areas and uh, the water then from these dikes is then uh, raised by windmills into um, the main rivers and then transported away so from above as you look down onto the broads you will see this really kind of complex network of not only rivers and, and lakes but also lots and lots of these straight drainage ditches so question seven says what is the name of the ditches that all of the other dikes drain into well we have a, a, a ditch then that runs next door to the rivers and that ditch is the one that all of the other drain all of the other ditches drain into and that one is known as a soak dike or sometimes called a sock dike and um, actually there's a number of local people that will have a, their own name for this um, but it's generally referred to as a soak dike a little diagram there to show how that works and you might be able to see that a bit clearer on your screen we mentioned previously that the Broads has a coastline. It has a 2.7 kilometre stretch of coastline in the county of Norfolk. And we have also previously mentioned that it's backed by some nice sand dunes. And it's a very important place for grey seals. So the question there, what species of seal can be spotted on Horsey Beach? Well, they are grey seals. They don't always strictly look grey and often they can look quite black or they can look quite white. But this is the breed or the species of seal that we have here and there can be hundreds of them on the beach at any one time particularly in the months from november through to february question nine which is the most common use for harvested reed and sedge so in many of the waterlogged areas of land within the broads there are reeds and there are things called rushes and sedge well these are all different types of plant that grow in these kind of waterlogged fields or waterlogged landscapes and the broads is one of the best areas for this in the country there's 1700 hectares of what we know as wildlife rich fen so we call this area fen it's the largest expanse of its type in the uk and within these areas we get what's called reed and sedge which are then actually not just these plants that grow but they're grown with a purpose and uh, they can be then harvested and used and the main traditional use for these things uh, for, for reed and sedge in particular is for roofing and uh, we lay them onto the roofs of lots of local houses and pubs and things like that and we call that thatching so you will see as you drive around this area 
many houses with these almost kind of straw-like roofs. In terms of tourism, well, the Broads has a huge amount of things to attract people here. Um, you can hire boats, if you like, and you can literally hire a boat by the hour and go off down the rivers and into the Broads um, on your own little boat. You can stay on a boat and hire a boat for a whole week or two weeks and, and sleep on that boat as well. You can go on these much bigger boats and old steamers and, and go on tours. You can cycle around the many footpaths and, and bridleways within the National Park. Um, and also you can get out in the water with more modern means of transport, such as the paddle boards or, or, or kayaks and canoes and, and things like that. So the question 10 says, how many people visit the Broads on average each year? Well, the answer to that question is around about seven and a half million people. So this area is extremely important to the local um, economy of, of, of many different businesses and uh, job opportunities for many local people and um, having tourism within the Broads is, is a very important um, aspect of the way in which the Broads operates. Question 11, uh, this is to do again perhaps with, with tourism and accommodation and uh, there are a huge array of places that you can stay whether those are holiday homes or even hotels and kind of traditional B&Bs or campsites, but we've got more and more luxury glamping sites and, and kind of unique places to stay. And you can even stay on, as I mentioned, boats and on houseboats as well. Question 11 says, what type of unique building can you stay on, on the River Brook, stay in, in the River Bure? Well, you can stay in that white building right at the middle of the bottom of the picture there, in the middle at the bottom of that picture. And that is in itself a mill. Uh, a windmill and you can stay in that windmill and experience what life would be like actually living in a windmill. Question 12 is asking us about some of the theme parks within the Broads National Park or within driving distance and, and um, close to the area of the park itself. Pleasurewood Hills is shown on this picture here actually and it's a classic theme park with roller coasters and rides. Bewilderwood is geared at perhaps slightly younger people and um, is mainly based around tree houses and um, aerial runways and, and ropes and um, the theme of kind of fairies and elves, very cute place to go and visit. And then finally, um, Roar is a, a classic dinosaur park with uh, again lots of, of rides and, and, and things that you can actually physically do while you're there. Question 12 then says what is the name of the crockle bog who lives at Bewilderwood? Well the answer to this one hopefully that you've got is Mildred. There she is in the water there or the older car wood, the swamp. So you have now got a grid in front of you, which is complete with lots of information, including the information that you have added as the answers to those questions. If you haven't yet added in all of those answers, then do that now. So you should end up with what we have on the screen there. So you've got a large amount of information here, and some of it is what we would know as specific information. And specific information is information that talks about you know, specific places, numbers, dates, names, sizes, etc. So what I'd like you to do is to grab again a highlighter or maybe just a coloured pen or a pencil and to highlight and pick out the specific bits of information that you have got there on that grid. Now there's an example that has been flagged up here uh, underneath the coastline box. So there we've highlighted it where it says that there is a 2.7 kilometre stretch of coastline, that's specific detail. Uh, we've also highlighted below where it says Horsey Beach, that's the specific name of the beach, so highlighted those things there. Okay, so do that with all of the other boxes and you will then have highlighted and picked out the specific detail that each one gives you. You can press pause now and press resume when you've done that. Okay, so Hopefully, now that you've done that, um, you are ready to move on. But for some of you, you'll be looking to actually stretch yourself and challenge yourself. And if you think, actually, I could do that easily, then maybe challenge yourself with these 
questions that have come up at the bottom of the screen. There'll be these on um, some later slides and later lessons that we do as well. And these are essentially kind of extension activities for those of you that think, oh, that was easy. I could easily do a little bit more than that. So you've got a couple of questions down there. The first one says, how do you think locals feel about seven and a half million tourists visiting their area each year? So have a little think about that. And what do you think you would feel like if you lived in the Broads? Would that be something that caused you anxiety or, or negativity? Or would it be something that you think, actually, this is quite positive. Maybe I can make a business and create opportunities out of the amount of people that are visiting my local area. So I would now like you to find the second worksheet that has been provided for this lesson. And that worksheet is just a blank page um, which is um, a landscape and in the middle of that page is a picture uh, or a field sketch and it's an aerial type of field sketch which shows hopefully a range of different landscapes within the broads. Now what I would like you to do is to use the information that you have got from the grid that you have just completed and to pick out the specific information that you've highlighted to add around the picture on that landscape page, some descriptive annotations. So an annotation is essentially a label, but with a little bit more information. It's a descriptive statement about something and the best of them contain specific details. So I've included at the top there, an example of the type of annotation that I could now confidently add to that picture because I've taken it from the information box that we were filling in earlier. So I know that's 2.7 kilometres of the coastline of the Broads, including Horsey Beach, are home to grey seals. So I've added that bit of information and an arrow to point to the shoreline on the picture and um, included my annotation at that point. So your challenge is to use your information in the grid that you have now got and to complete this page of the annotated um, field sketch with lots of different arrows and statements pointing out lots of different landscapes and land uses within the broads. So there we go. Use your information, a pencil and a ruler, to try and add 12 annotations with perhaps each no more than 12, maybe 15 words to the sketch of the broads that you've been given. Try to add your annotations at the nearest point outside the box. That just makes it a bit easier to read and to, to look at where you haven't got lots of kind of crisscrossed lines. OK. Again, like I mentioned earlier, if you finish that quite quickly and you think, oh, this is quite interesting or I found that very easy, then here's a couple of challenges to stretch you a little bit further. First one, what job do you think is the most rewarding in the broads and why? And who do you think the broads appeals to most? Actually, would you like to visit? And you can elaborate on that answer. So you can pause me now and use the information that you've got to complete your annotated sketch. And if you've finished, have a go at those two challenges on the right hand side. OK, so hopefully you've made a very nice, detailed, annotated field sketch. You can choose to colour that in further if you like, just to make those landscapes stand out a little bit more from each other. So in this lesson, we've learned about the different land uses that we have in the broads. You've developed your skills of condensing the information that you had in that information box or those 12 information boxes and then you applied that information to the annotated field sketch and all of those are important skills for geographers. We've now got to finish off with three challenges. Firstly I'd like you to name five specific land uses and abroad so that should be easy because you've just done 12 of them. Challenge two, expand on the following terms with a 10 word description for thatching so what is thatching? What do we mean by swamp? And what do we mean by a soak dike? I'll give you a clue, those last two are linked. Challenge three, justify why the Broads landscape is known as a mosaic. So think about that one. What is a mosaic and why might, why, why might the Broads be known as a mosaic? All right, well done today and we'll see you back for the next lesson.